and Naresh and everybody at DFAT, thank you very much for having me here. I wasn't quite certain if I would be able to, and so I was not able to tell Sanat, I think, till a few days ago that I would present. So Indian perspectives, basically, as we have heard all morning, it's all about geopolitics and technology when it comes to outer space, as with nuclear, indeed. And we've heard this morning about the technology denial regimes, which is what those that were, uh, or the three that have been, or four that have been on the high table for the longest time, all these uh, export controls for uh, missile technologies and advanced technologies have been denied to us. But in any case, India of 2019 is a very different place. Excepting for NSG, we are members of other um, export control regimes. As far as China is concerned, it has not yet been uh, allowed to enter into the MTCR regime. And the reason why I have put over there that it has been a member of the COPUS and the IADC in 2007 is because it was a very prominent member of these organizations when it conducted its ASAT test. And it continues to be a prominent member. When one speaks about being a responsible space faring power or a responsible nuclear power, you'd have to consider the facts in geopolitics that it has been, where the anti-ballistic missile treaty, the US has jettisoned it unilaterally, the conference on disarmament is in a state of paralysis because the resolution on the prevention of arms race in outer space, PAROS, has been consistently prevented and voted against by the United States. The intermediate range nuclear force treaty is in its death throes. We have no idea whether it will be renewed. Likely not. The United States has exited unilaterally from the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, which is the nuclear deal. And so sometimes one is unable to understand that for the last decade since the Second World War, and in particularly post-Cold um, uh, War period, the US diplomacy has concentrated on containing and a deterrence for the proliferation of nuclear technologies. And now suddenly you have a uh, political dispensation that's thrown it all to the wind. So one is confused about what is exactly the approach of the United States. And the one thing that we have to remember is when they pass these kinds of laws in their Congress, they call it the sense of the House. That means that elected body of those numbers of years, that is their sense. When the next lot gets elected and comes, well, that sense might change. And that, I think, is a very good device because it doesn't absolutely you know, put you in a sort of straitjacket. And of course, because of all of this, uh, the non-proliferation treaty has been given indefinite extension. So while there has been a reduction of arms, there is still a feeling of instability. Meanwhile, India has, is emerging as a nuclear military space power. We are expanding our research to the Antarctica, we know that we have the Dakshin Gangotri in the, to the Arctic now, we have in Antarctic already. China is already an economic military space power. When it conducted its ASAT, it was the leading light in the UN as it remains. Iran, nuclear space military, North Korea, nuclear. Russia and NATO are actually now trying to see how they can work together. Russia has an Arctic Circle policy, and China power and uh, China has its policy. So the, it's a churning sort of cauldron, if you like, and it moves all the time. But somehow we have gate crashed into the whole situation with this ASAT. And as I think Maruf Raza was speaking about, the reactions, the reactions every time India has done, whether it was Mrs. Gandhi, and the nuclear test, and uh, under Mr. Vajpayee, the 1998 test, and now the ASAT. So of course, although I'm talking about uh, taking a quotation of the Secure World Foundation, there you've heard in the morning of many other such uh, reactions. Jolt to space stability. 
I'm unable to understand, excepting to say that it's a Western view of looking at things. Here is this Johnny-come-lately who's now standing in the wing saying, look, put a chair for me too. Same as India's underground tests. We were not at all in breach of any nuclear treaty. Underground tests are allowed, and that's what we did. But for the West, would the world survive the second nuclear age? Because it would be expected that for an Eastern country such as India, and then soon followed by Pakistan, they would have these knee-jerk, hysterical reactions, and God alone knows what kind of fate is about to befall the world. Then none of that has happened, as we know. So anyway, one lives with the Western perception. Nuclear proliferation has happened a long ago, long before we decided to see what we could do about it. But now here we are. The starting point, as was pointed out by Naresh Varma, was India's ASAT, what after? And so it is in that context that I had prepared this presentation. So I will say it the way that I did. India is a responsible country and will continue to be. It is a responsible spacefaring power and we will continue to be. And we will continue to contribute. Now the thing is this, that at this point in time, yes, we have created debris. And as somebody pointed out to me that several years ago, I was going hammer and tongs, quoting chapter and verse from the space law treaties to say China has done absolutely the wrong thing and they should not have done it. Yes. I fully support India's ASAT, but I hate the debris we've created. So be that as it may, the fact is that the Chinese 2007 ASAT <coughs> treaty brought absolutely bang to the table and in everybody's face that the world had to get together and they had to take sensible decisions to make sure that we were not creating any more debris and certainly that space could be used as a sustainable for sustainable use and that there should be freedom of access to go, enter exit and operate in space so the europeans came up with what they called the european code of conduct for space activities in 2008 i think many of us will remember that event and this was a mandatory code the first draft of that code had a sheaf of uh, forms with it because it required every launch to be informed in advance with the greatest depth and detail. In fact, there was resistance from amongst the European Union members. England, for example, said, well, what about na national exigency? How can you completely remove that? France had the same view. So the basic effort was to restrict or to prohibit the development of ASAT capability to achieve safety and security of outer space and to assure its sustainable use. Now, this was sometimes in, I think, the January of 2008. You remember that the Chinese ASAT was in January of 2007. But in effect, what it would have meant was that the sovereign right of countries to develop and use means that are designed to incapacitate or destroy satellites that in their sovereign assessment was a threat to their national security would be a closed option. And as somebody referred to just now, I think Satyam did just now, or earlier speaker, the US launched that SM-3 missile, to intercept a missile to bring down its own satellite, which it said it was doing to save the world and the Earth's environment from the leaking fuel tank. Yes, the world was up in arms against China for debris. The Americans had learned that, you know, it's no use talking about debris. The best is the environment. We are trying to protect the environment. But it was in response not only to China, but also in response to the mandatory EU code to say and to reiterate their national policy, which has been consistent, that there is no way in which the sovereign right of the United States will be impinged by any international or multilateral treaty to exercise that sovereign right in its own defense. And so therefore, in order to earn US support, the EU code has transmutated itself into an international code of conduct, which is a voluntary best practices for outer space activities. So in other words, nothing which has the remotest context to 
fixed, permanent, is going to be tolerated by the international community. So now what do we do? Of course, India as a responsible power must say that debris limitation is a user essential. Has to be and we should promote that. How shall we, how shall we create that narrative? So maybe what we can do is to look to some older treaties. The Limited Test Ban Treaty of 1963 recognized the incapacity of the great commons of the outer space, the oceans, and the atmosphere to bear repeated assaults, repeated nuclear assaults. And that is why the Limited Test Ban Treaty has prohibited the use of nuclear weapons in outer space, in atmosphere, and in the oceans. But it left open ground testing. Together with that, here is the Nuclear Threshold Test Ban Treaty of 1963 between the Soviet Union and America. And what they did is that as between them, they agreed to set a limit of 150 kilotons for underground nuclear tests. Now, can we draw inspiration from the TTBT, the Threshold Test Ban Treaty? Could it be achieved for the purpose of limiting space debris? And what would be the requirement for that? Is that the international community will have to specify an upper altitude limit for ASAT tests and maintaining a voluntary moratorium on such a test. The question that would arise is what is that uh, altitude limit, the upper altitude limit, and how is anybody going to be able to determine that that precisely is the altitude limit? The second aspect we're going to deal with is that in the United Nations, uh, treaties or resolutions and the manner of decision making is by consensus. Now we know that there is going to never going to be consensus for the reason that if you come up with saying, well, you cannot do it, and then there's no way forward. So let's see whether we can promote the idea of an interim. I mean, you won't call it TTBT, but interim mitigation of space debris TT, for example, you know, short term. We'll take it from there as it comes. And in any case, such a debris mitigation treaty, the aim of that exercise in our narrative is, of course, and as it will be, even if not, is to preserve the space commons, which is the province of mankind, and therefore entirely consistent with the Outer Space Treaty and the other surrounding treaties. Now, I believe that a TTBT type interim mitigation of space debris treaty will serve India's spacefaring interests without constraining tests of direct ascent endo atmospheric hit to kill of March 1991, which provided substantial experimental evidence to sustain a threshold limit of not more than 100 kilometers. So of course, in order to determine this, all the countries would, and in this case, there are now four countries, would have to agree to jointly conduct a hit and type test. And then determine that, okay, right now, this is the altitude. And if you're on the high table, will you, uh, you know, put that as a high altitude. You cannot deny to other countries what you have achieved yourself. That has been our long struggle in the international community, that you know, cannot have a high table and say that, okay, well, we've got it, sorry, but you can't have it. That's not fair. So let us allow countries to develop what they want, but let us have a threshold for the upper altitude. And this, and I think the Japanese would be able to help India and help the other countries to undertake such a test and come up with this solution. Now, this is something, Ajay, you will remember back in the day when IDSA was doing that workshop. And that on that day, the question on the table for our, that little committee that had been formed is how, what should India's response be to the European Code of Conduct? So, of course, all of us there said, of course, we should test ASAT. And then we'll deal with, the, we'll deal with it afterwards. But the point is, what shall we say about the European Code of Conduct? Or even the metamorphosized International Code of Conduct? Shall we say yes, no, not say anything, 
anyway, the long and short of the story is that in the nick of time, we have done this. And now we have to canvas, our foreign policy must canvas a TTBT tribe treaty and suggest that this is the way to do it. Limit debris. The other aspect, of course, and personal to India, is arms control and domain denial, because that is the real thing, isn't it? When you look at the US foreign policy, or indeed any other country, Russia, China, whoever, the point is that why do we fear them? We fear them because they have the ability to stop you dead and destroy your, you know, your assets and space, if they should wish to, because they have the capability. India doesn't have that capability, it tested this technology, but it is not us to say that we will be able to you know, blast anybody out of shape. So, but nonetheless, arms control is a domain desirable. Paros has been on the table for the longest time, and so we want to also support uh, the progress of Paros in the conference on disarmament. So we will recall that following 9-11, by non-state actors, it was believed by the international community, and there was apprehension that in the future, such attacks would be conducted by the uh, non-space actors, having access to dual-use equipment, materials, and technology, and developing and deploying them to deliver NBC, weapons of mass destruction, nuclear, biological, and chemical. Now this, Chapter 7 UNSC, which is Resolution 1540, says it requires, mandatorily requires all member states of the United Nations to take an array of legal national measures to prevent and thwart such access, and this is important, regardless of whether or not states have any assets, expertise or activity, connected with or related to WMD and the means of their deliveries. This is the first time in international law that a resolution of the UNSC established mandatory universal obligations on states. So we could borrow from here the idea, and India could canvas proactively uh, chapter 7, 1540 type resolution to say that mandatorily requires all member states of the UN to take an array of legal national measures to prevent and thwart suspected ASTs attempts regardless of whether or not states have any assets, expertise or activity connected with or related to spacecraft, launch vehicles, missiles or high powered lasers. And I think foreign policy has a great role to play. But the basis and the backbone of our foreign policy is technological capability. And of course, other than this technological capability, we've also mentioned space situational awareness, meteorological capability, satellite meteorological capability, cyber capability, electronic warfare capability, but also the absolute understanding that the Fourth Industrial Revolution, ICTs, is something that we simply have to master and we have to be able to deploy to our benefit. Not in the least, we have to be cognizant of the fact of malicious cyber activity and the role of state actors in malicious space activity. We have seen in the case of Iran, early on, computers, with software and programs pertaining to the nuclear program were simply uh, busted because of Stuxnet, the malware. It has happened again recently, I think it was reported in the newspaper. The countries that are themselves creating um, space weapons, call it space weapon for the lack of a better word, are the United States, Russia, Israel, China, North Korea, Iran. They are at the frontier. We are not required only to protect ourselves, but we have to have systems that are resilient. <coughs> when you talk of our digital architecture, it's an aging and ancient digital architecture. From the time that we first got our internet to now is about 25 years. And I don't know what is the capacity of that, and certainly not as far as military architecture is concerned. 
So these are some of the things that must necessarily go hand in hand. That is not a matter of advertising or foreign policy, but it is certainly the backbone on which foreign policy can canvas for both space debris limitation as a user essential and space arms control as a desirable element of space. Thank you very much. <laughs>